Hey, welcome to the Lot One Podcast. Let's get into the show. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Lot One Podcast. My name is DJ. I'm a uh... One of your hosts uh, this evening uh, or this morning, or whenever you listen, you know, these podcasts kind of go at any point in the day, but I'm a writer, director, producer. Sometimes PA. Oh, you know what? No, no. After the last time, I'm never a PA again. <laughs> never a PA. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Christopher Henley. I am the CEO and co-host of the Lot One Podcast and, uh, well, CEO of Lot One Productions, not the podcast, but uh, sometimes PA. Um sometimes more than than normal but i also mostly produce are you the ceo also of the lot one podcast as well yeah we know it's just it's weird you know let's let's get into the (laughs) nitty-gritty details of your all your roles the inner workings (laughs) (laughs) today we have a uh, very special guest um Stu krieger uh who i don't know if you guys know this or not but he's probably written some of your favorite childhood memories uh i know he's written some of mine um welcome to the show it is a pleasure to be here um for those people who don't know you and who will if they don't know you they they do know you and they just don't know that they know you uh why don't you give them a a little bit of a bio on uh, who you are and what you do sure Uh, i was a film and television writer for more than 30 years before i made a pivot to academia in 2006 And as a screenwriter, my career kind of took a big leap and turn when I became a dad myself and suddenly realized going to films with my children that doesn't have to be quite so stupid as so many of the movies I was seeing. And so I got very involved in family entertainment that began with I was working on Amazing Stories, which was Steven Spielberg's first foray into television. Mm -hmm. And we were in year two of the show and his head of development came to me and said, Stephen and George have an animated dinosaur movie they want to produce and are looking for a writer. Do you want to write it for them? And what I have said to my students many times is when somebody says Steven Spielberg and George Lucas have a movie they want you to write, you say yes. You don't (laughs) ask a lot of questions. You just say yes. Uh, So I did The Land Before Time for them. I did another film with Don Bluth called The Troll in Central Park. I did Mm -hmm. a film called Monkey Trouble. And then in 1999, I got involved with the Disney Channel, who was just beginning their run of DCOMs, the Disney Channel original movies, where they were having a movie premiere every Friday night. And when they had the first 50 movie, a party celebrating the first 50 movies, I had written 10 of them. So I said, "Eh, not a bad track record. (laughs) Uh, Among those were Xenon and its two sequels, including the sequel, uh, Smart House, (laughs) Confessions, Cowbells, Gotta Kick It Up, and more. That's amazing. Wow. That's really great. And then you you pivoted over to uh, teaching, right? Yes. So I guess we can get right into it. What what yeah. what was the uh, what made you want to switch over into that? Uh, I was really fortunate in terms of the whole kind of trajectory of my career has been really really wonderful in terms of I'm somebody that's always needed to keep moving and keep evolving and so I had a mentor in the industry, an incredible man named Larry Turman, and Larry produced The Graduate. He produced American History X, River Wild. He Mm. was just a phenomenal producer, but he was also, as I mentioned, a mentor to me. And even though we never ended up making a film together, we developed a couple projects, and he was someone like every six months or so, he just called me, what are you working on? Let's have lunch, let's check in. And then in 2001, over the summer, he said, come to lunch, I got something I want to talk to you about. And he said, I am now the dean of the Peter Stark producing program at USC. And even though it's a producing program, I want to add a writing class because even if they become producers and studio executives and agents, they need to know how to work with writers and talk to writers, understand the process. And Larry said, you strike me as somebody who's a natural teacher. Do you want to teach this class for me? And I said, yes, please. And so I started doing that. I was really, really enjoying it. And everything you've ever heard about the entertainment industry in terms of at some point, you are not the new kid in town anymore. You are not the flavor of the month. You are beginning to reach an age where everything about the ageist aspect of the industry is very true. Mm -hmm. And I was really enjoying teaching. And I was also going out for jobs I didn't even want to get. And I would be in the interview and do this kind of wonderful self-sabotage thing of like, you know, oh, don't say that because you might get the job and you don't want the job. 
Um, <laughs> and I came home from teaching my SC class one night and my wife said, you are really happy when you are teaching and you have this buoyancy and this smile and this thing that's much more the guy I married than when you come home from being beat up in show business. Maybe you should be teaching more. And I went to lunch with a friend who was teaching at Loyola, asked him for, you know, if I was interested in teaching more, what I might do. And he sent me to the Chronicle of Higher Education website. I went on, a posting came up, said, Professor at UC Riverside must have teaching experience and film and television experience. And I said, this guy uh, <laughs> applied for the job. I got a call from Professor Robin Russin, who Christopher knows, who said, we got an avalanche of applications for this job. It's going to take us a while to sort it out, but you are somebody we're interested in. Please stay tuned. Uh, and six months later, I got the job. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. I was going to, I was going to say like the, uh, <laughs> the journey from, from that to like UCR, for those who don't know, that's where I met Stu. He was a professor there, which actually I didn't even have any of your classes. I never got the opportunity <laughs> to take a Stu class. Um, okay. that's how, that's how I got to, to meet you and meet so many great filmmakers also through Stu at the university of California Riverside. So, uh, for those who kept like wondering where that connection was, that's, that's specifically where that came from. Yep. And, yeah. and the, the thing that was really nice about the timing of all of it is, you know, part of my confidence in going into interview for that job is I really felt I was at a place where I had things to teach and lessons to impart mm -hmm. and things to share. And one of the missions for me as a teacher from the very beginning that continues to this day is I can talk real world and I can talk real world. Here are the highs. Here are the lows. Here are the good days. Here are the horrible days. And if you're not prepared to navigate a life somewhere in between, do something else. And I, and I think, you know, that real talk is so important for students of so many of them come into the program with this idea of what I always say, it's not all sunshine and autographs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so being able to kind of provide that, here are the really wonderful things about it. Here's some creative triumphs and great days I've had. And then mm -hmm. here's some real lows that go along with it. Learn to navigate. Yeah. That's really interesting because I think a lot of times, you know, I, I, mean, I don't know, to be honest, but uh, I just know in my program that I went to, I, I went to a film program or two in, uh, in Oregon and yep. near Portland. And uh, I think that some of the, some of the people that were in the teaching the classes, like they had some experience, but they didn't really have a whole lot of experience, I think. And so they had a lot of the theory and so that's sort of what we learned a lot is like the theories of, of things. And when I actually went out to, to go into there, it was a lot different than I realized, you know? So it's kind of cool that you have that experience and you're able to sort of give that to your students. Uh, the question I have though is, did you, have you always been a sort of a person who wanted to teach people or is that something that sort of like you, you sort of developed later? No, I was a camp counselor for all four summers of my college career. Uh, I actually babysat through high school and most guys didn't, but there was a lot of families in the neighborhood that wanted a male babysitter for their sons. And, you know, yeah. so, so I think that kind of mentoring thing was always part of my personality and I always enjoyed young people. And, and now I really feel like there's so much of, I, my wife was just on the phone with a friend of ours yesterday and he said, I can't believe all the things that Stu is still doing and where does he get the energy and, you know, shouldn't he be slowing down at this point? And, and I really feel like there's so much that I get back at this point. And one of the things I say often in class is I learn as much from you guys on a daily basis as you, you learn from me. And I really do believe that. But it also then is there's just such a positive energy and an optimism and a fuel that I get from it that, uh, that I really do feel it's a mutual give and take as opposed to just me giving, I really feel that I get so much back. So did you, when you got your start as a writer, like we, we kind of glossed over a little bit, but like, yeah. you know, the big part of this podcast is like the filmmaking journey. So like, where did you, what convinced you, you know what? I want to be a writer for film and TV. Um, mm -hmm. Like where, what was that moment? Was it a teacher or was it just. It's twofold. Cause I've said this in many other interviews and it, it it's funny because sometimes I'll feel like, Dude, you've said that a hundred times, but it's like when it's the <laughs> truth, you got to say it again. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know. So, which is, 
I was very unusual in the sense that I was a little kid in Rochester, New York, with no connection to the industry. Mm. And like first and second grade, first I thought I wanted to be an actor. And, you know, I'm kind of strawberry blonde now, but as a kid, I had this flaming red hair. And at some point, a big giant red afro that went with it. <laughs> and when I was, you know, first and second grade, I used to take pictures out of the family album, put them in an envelope, address it to Walt Disney, Hollywood, California, and put on the back of the picture, look at me, I'm a cute redhead, you should put me in one of your movies. Uh, <laughs> the odd thing was, Walt never wrote back, he never did cast me. Uh, <laughs> but then we made a family trip to Los Angeles when I was 12 years old, and on that trip I said to my family, two questions. First of all, this exists, and you people are going back to Rochester, New York? And they were like, mm. yeah. And I said, well, then let me tell you, as soon as I'm old enough to make my own decisions, this is where I belong. This is where I'll be. This is what I'm coming back to. Yeah. And then, you know, to your point, Chris, in college, it was the first time that I had, it was actually a husband and wife pair of teach professors. And they were the first two people that said to me, I really think you could do this. I, I see something in your work and in your writing where I think you could make a living doing this. And that was so important to me because it was just having some objective outside as opposed to my Jewish mother, which was, of course, darling, you'll be fine, you'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but this was the outside objective voice saying, I think you could do it. And it was like, good, because that's where I'm going. And yeah. one of the things that I said about my early success is, you know, I started in the 70s when it was before Entertainment Tonight, before the internet, mm. before all the information dump about the industry. And I think part of my success was I was too dumb to know the odds against me. You know, sort of like I have this attitude of somebody's writing this stuff. Why shouldn't it be me? You know, and, right. and I really just kind of had these blinders on of not thinking about the competition or the odds or any of it. It was just like, this is what I'm going to do. Wow. That's really good. I think that's actually kind of important, especially when you're starting out, is to have that those blinders on and and not focus on the because if you do focus on the you're never gonna do it you know no. um no. yeah that's really that's really good do, do you feel like you were a, a kid that sort of wrote all the time like yeah. in your spare time yeah when i moved to la i found this very embarrassing like first novel that i wrote in early high school and you know it's all this anxious coming of age and first love and all this stuff and it's quite terrible but it exists <laughs> 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 so it was just short stories when I was a little kid and I also draw drew so I would make my own comic books and do that kind of nice. stuff so, so that kind of creative energy was always very very much part of my life so you've always yeah. kind of been a writer you've always kind of written yeah no yeah cool and, so and then the other go ahead sorry I was gonna say real quickly the other thing that I've always done starting in college and up until last night um I'm a journal writer as well Oh, nice. And that's really good. And and we'll get to this later. But, you know, the book that I had come out in April is based in part in things that were going on 20 years ago. And to be able to go back to my journal and look through them and flip through and find actual emotions mm -hmm. of what I was feeling rather than trying to reinvent it or reimagine it is phenomenally helpful. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I actually I heard a lot about, the, about that. Keeping about a journal. Journaling. Yeah. Because I was going yeah. to touch on that. Like. I know a few people who do journaling, but I, I mean, the modern day version of journaling is vlogging, right? Yeah. You know, it in a lot of ways. I mean, instead of handwriting it, it's you're you're videotaping it or whatever. But to be able to like catalog moments in your life through if it's just vlogging or journaling or whatever, and then being able to at the, you know, further down the line, go back and take from it and, and create yeah. more content and create more things out of it, I think is really intriguing because that's something that i have these notepads that i do all my notes on just like the standard like white or yellow i don't even know what, what it's legal called pads. i forget legal pads yeah. yeah and i keep them all i have a stack of them hmm. yeah which probably should be bigger but they don't make any sense <laughs> half the time but <laughs> i have them and i've actually gone back and referred to them so do you think that like nice. that has the the journaling has been an important journey for you as a writer hundred percent because the thing is, and I think the difference between vlogging or blogging or anything that's more public is I think you're more honest and you're more candid because I'm not mm. worrying about, you know, being judged or who's going to think this or but that. And so, you know, there, the frustrating part of it is 
I will have these moments of like, oh my God, I just made the most incredible discovery or I had this epiphany or something profound. And then I'll go back and read a journal from 10 years ago when I had that exact same revelation. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dude, you already learned that lesson. You just forgot to learn. Um, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. So that sometimes can be frustrating, but, but what is really invaluable as a writer then is to access the, you know, what was I feeling the night my son was born? What mm. was I feeling when my wife and I had this incredible fight and had to work our way back from it? You know, but, but like I said, it's almost like having a log of, go into the shrink because I feel like I can be much more candid in a personal journal than I would be if, you know, it was all public. Yeah. I always think it's really interesting. Like, uh, well, actually I have an, I have another question that's sort of like, uh, uh, a early stage question. What do you feel like the lear learning curve for when you actually got to LA as a writer, you were writing before, right? And I'm assuming, yep. you know, um, you didn't maybe know the filmmaking language when you first got to LA, but you had to learn it. Like, what was that learning curve like when you were uh, just starting out? It's two things. It's one, I'm, all, and this is something I say to my students every single class I've taught, which is if you're a writer, write. Because every mm -hmm. time you're writing, you're learning something, you're discovering something, you're getting better. And so, one of the things I always felt was an advantage as a writer versus a director or an actor is. You don't need anybody else to do that. And mm -hmm. so I get very frustrated sometimes when students will come in and go, so I want to talk to you about grad school because I'm a writer. And it's like, okay, what are you working on? Well, I got some ideas. It's like, then you're not a writer. You're an idea guy. <laughs> you know, If you're a writer, tell me I've got seven screenplays at home that I've been working on for the last four years, or I've got you know, three treatments and two screenplays or whatever it is. Mm. But you don't have to wait for anybody else. You don't need the team. You don't need the lab. You don't need anything but a yellow legal pad and a pen. So if you're a writer, be writing. And that's something I was always doing. Hmm. And then the other part of it was reading scripts and looking at films and looking at films. I, I will say, you know, watch a film the first time as an audience and then watch it a second time as a student. Hmm. And when you're watching it as a student, if you're having an emotional reaction, how did they get me? Why did I get invested in that character? What was the moment I got drawn in? You know, what are these things that are sucking me in in a way that I can then re recreate in my own work. And then conversely, it can be, you know, when did they lose you? When did you decide that you weren't enjoying the film? When did you switch the channel? When did, you know, whatever that was. But I think if you can do that bifurcation of the first time through, you're an audience and just relax and go on the ride. And then the second time, go back and analyze what worked, what didn't work. And then the other thing is to be reading screenplays, because that's how I learned just the language of an interior, exterior, mm. action versus slug lines, and just read scripts, and especially if they're scripts from movies you love, yeah. you know, use that as your learning tool, and you don't. So all of those things don't require tuition. They don't require classrooms. They don't require a lab. They don't require a studio. I, it, Christopher's probably heard me say this because it's <laughs> one of my mantras on campus, but I'll say at some point I'm going to court and changing my name to Professor Nike because I just say, just do it. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see. You, know, yeah. you don't need permission. You don't need a studio. Just do it. Yeah. It's great that you bring that up, though, because uh, something I'm sure, Deji, you've heard me say it, but I always tell people is like, that's kind of where Lot One was born, was the just do it mantra, right? Yeah. Um, it, we've, I've said this on the podcast before, but there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity at the time that I was at UCR um, to get the experience that I felt like I needed or that I wanted. And that's why I joined uh, the club, Our Shorts, where we made films and stuff, which then led to is like, hey, we're already doing this. Why don't we just continue to do it and do it more on our own terms outside of college? Like, we're basically a production company. Why not continue it past that? Yeah. And that's where a lot one came from. And it just came down to like, there's been so many times where we've been like, are we going to film this thing? And Christian Hoffman, you know, my right hand man, who was also one of your students, he was just yep. like, we just need to do it. He was like, literally, let's just go do it. And then we would go and do it. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But, you know, we came out as better filmmakers afterwards. So, like, mm. it's funny that you bring yeah. that up because I totally forgot that, like, that's probably where it came from. Like, we can attribute <laughs> a lot of the success or the creation of the company from those things we learned at UCR. 
you know. And I will say back because I don't know if you know this, but I use you guys as examples all the time. Oh. I'm talking about you know <laughs> these guys cool. met and became friends through our shorts, and then decided they were going to perpetuate, and they're doing it, and they're just making stuff happen all the time. And there's branches and offshoots, and you have, I mean, you the current students have absolutely no excuse for not making no. stuff. And, and yep. then I'll always you know also refer back to insecure and i go you know Issa ray did that as a web series and hbo paid attention to the amount of traction it was getting and suddenly picked it up and it became you know a, an award-winning hbo show but it started be and same with fleabag you know fleabag was a one woman, woman stage show mm. that saw and turned into a series so it's like Great show. yeah and so it's like go do stuff because careers are being born that way yeah and if you're mm -hmm. sitting at home going Someday I want to be a filmmaker. I can pretty much promise you nobody's going to knock on the door and any filmmakers live here. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to go be doing it. That's funny. I, uh, I do. I, I love that mantra. And I, and I more recently I've been thinking, not even just thinking, but I've been like sort of acting and, and you know, because my, my goal is to be a better director. Um, and so I'm just going out and actually starting to write things, you know, that are, I've written overnight, you know, like, um, <clears throat> just to have the practice and just to have a little bit of, of, um, of these things under my belt. But in terms of writing, um, I oftentimes get, you know, I get super excited about ideas, right? I'm like, I feel like I am that, that idea guy. I'm like, oh, I love this idea. So this is really great. And then I'm like going into the details I'm getting really bogged down into the weeds here. And then I go to write it and then I'm like, ha, ha, ha. you know, how's this <laughs> supposed to go? And then, and then I feel like, um, I get some stuff on paper and then after a while I'm just like, I've either written myself into a I don't know how to get out of it. And then I'm just like, oh, I can't keep going because it's not, and I, and I think it has something to do with perfectionism. And so how do you sort of like tell people or how do, how do people get out of that? You know? Yeah. What? Well, your timing is perfect because I had a meeting last week with a student who is very talented and just signed with a manager and he's doing great things, but he also suffers the same syndrome where he will work a scene for a week and a half on four pages and back and forth and over and yeah. again. And I said to him, our project this summer is I'm going to break you of that habit because here's why. You are aiming for perfection that does not exist. And in the collaborative nature of film and television, anything you do that somebody's interested in, you're going to get notes, you're going to get feedback, you're going to be rewriting. So you could turn something out in three weeks that's good and solid representation of the idea you want to do and then find your partners and your collaborators because you're still going to get notes, you're still going to be refining, mm. or you can sit on it for two years and starve to death. Your choice. <laughs> you know? And one of yeah. the reasons why I ended up doing, I think ultimately it was 13 or 14 movies for the Disney Channel was... Because they knew if they, you know, they were, as I mentioned at the beginning, they were doing a movie a month. And a lot of them, what I was proud of with my track record, I, I was either the only writer or the last writer. And mm -hmm. if you're the last writer, it means it was your draft that got the green light for the film to go in production. But a lot of times I would get a script from them and they would say, we really like the premise of this. We like the basic concept, but we're not happy with either the characters or the relationships or the emotional through line or whatever it was you have three weeks to rewrite it because we're starting filming on this day. And if they said that they got a script in three weeks and it was a script they could shoot. Wow. And you got to just be able to train yourself to like, you know, this is what the market requires. This is what I'm going to do because I want to be employed. I want to support my family. Yeah. And I've had students over the years that have said to me, you know, how did you get over writer's block? And my kind of flippant answer is always, I never had writer's block. I had a mortgage. <laughs> like what i meant by that was you know i didn't give myself the luxury of having writer's block it's like dude yeah. sit down and write something because if there's something right. there's something to make better and and if you indulge yourself like oh i'm sorry i'm just stuck today i think i'll go walk on the beach it's like okay but again you've got children that want to eat dinner so yeah. sit down and write them i really like that actually i love the idea of because I think a lot of time, for at least for me, I can only speak for myself. But you know, I'm I'm putting so much emphasis on the characters, and and I'm, I've got these. They have to be realistic. They have to be true to who they who I feel like they are. And at the end of the day, you know, 
no one cares about these characters if they never see them, right? So, um, mm-hmm. all the all this effort that I've put in is is for almost nothing unless someone is able to like look at the characters and be like, oh, cool, that's a cool character, and so. Um, but, th- but by putting, you know, the focus outside of ourselves, right. Where it's like, I'm doing this because it gets the next step. I get a paycheck and, uh, these characters are not going to, it almost, it feels like the characters are running me, you know, I'm like, they won't let me go unless they t- I tell the story. Right. But like in the scenario that you're putting forward is like, you're sort of like, you're running them. You're like, all right, cool. You guys are good. You guys are good enough. You know? So I love that. That helps me actually. Yeah, and I mean, the flip side of that is I always say the absolute best days I had in my career because I am not a tortured writer. I had friends in my years in the industry that was like, oh, my God, every day dragging myself to the computer. (laughs) And it's like, man, I'm never happier. But the flip side of what you were saying was there would be days where I would sit down at my computer at 930 in the morning and and look up at the clock and go, damn, it's one o'clock. What happened? You know, and I would be so lost in the world and so pulled along by the characters, by the story that I was 100% there and not even aware that, you know, there was an outside world around me. But those were always just such good, rewarding days because it was like, you know, it's kicking. It's firing on all cylinders. It's moving forward and I'm lost in that world. But that that's also, I mean, I felt that I was very fortunate in terms of my ability to just kind of focus. And right. I was phenomenally disciplined in terms of, you know, through all the years I was doing it, I was in the office at 930 in the morning. I worked till one o'clock. I went to lunch. I came back and worked till five o'clock. And people would say, you're so disciplined. And I would go, do you go to your job every day? And they were like, yeah. And I go, oh, you're so disciplined. Like, this is my job. (laughs) It's what I do. Like I said, it's how I pay the mortgage. So I got to go to my job. It's so interesting you bring that up because that's one of the things we're working at uh, on lot one is like, because we have day jobs still, because we're not quite at the point where like we can make this our full time thing, um, yep. is like treating it like the the job that it's supposed to be. You know, the same thing. Tuesdays we work from twelve to four, and that's our administrative time. That's when we get meetings done and like blah 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 stuff like that. So it's like it's really interesting that you've treated it the same way that I've been like uh, trying to get us used to, because one day it it is going to be the mortgage. It is going to be, you know, the, the, uh, cinema camera that costs me a mortgage, you know, whatever it is, uh, those types of things. So, um, one of the questions that I have though, is, you know, you talk about like working in the past and stuff, but are you still actively writing for television and film while teaching or is your main focus just teaching in your book? Uh, when that transition happened was the first year and a half that I was at UCR, I was also the head writer and story editor for an animated show called Toot and Puddle for Nickelodeon. Mm. And what that meant as story editor is there were 26 episodes. I wrote nine of them. I story edited all the rest of them. I was the liaison between the writing staff and the studio and the production company. So I would get three sets of notes that I then had to synthesize and distribute to the writers and then get their feedback, you know, so it was incredibly time consuming and bureaucratic in addition to the creative side of it. And I was full time at UCR and I came home one day and sat down and went, okay, I'm now working 90 hours a week. And that actually was not the goal that I had when I did this. And again, I I am not, not Oprah, the secret woo woo, but I'm a very big believer in the, the universe talking to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had had that, realization and then a couple weeks later my agent called me and he said i wanted to let you know that i'm going to make a transition out of agenting and into management but there's i was at paradigm agency at the time and he said there's a number of other agents here who would be happy to take you on as a client do you want me to set up some meetings and i said no you know what again i think this is the universe telling me let's kind of take a pause the teaching is something where I really want my energy and my focus. Mm-hmm. I am a writer. I will always need to be writing. But the idea of writing books right now is so appealing because it's my time schedule. It's my, you know, I'll write when I can write. I'll teach when I can teach. Mm-hmm. I do not teach summer school. So I'm off all summer, which is June. To, you know, UCR doesn't go back to the end of September. So it was yeah. at least four months a year where I could be writing. And it just felt like the right balance. But it also meant with the first book I did that came out in 2017, that was seven years in the making. And part of that was it's hist- an alternate history fiction 
So there was a lot of research that I had to do first. But then in 2012, as I mentioned earlier, I became department chair. And during those three years, there was just no writing time. Mm -hmm. So I put it away. The first draft of the book was over 500 pages. The actual book is about 320 pages because I oh. slashed and burned. And one of the, the great joys of moving from screenplays to prose was I don't have to do 90 pages for Disney Channel. I can just write, 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 write. <laughs> no. When I went back to it, there was all these subplots that were like, dude, okay, but what's that have to do with you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the book you're having? So I, the slash and burn of it, I could do really easily because I had had the time away and I came back with more objective eyes of what's this actual story. Mm. So like I said, that was seven years in the making and was published in 2017. And then my newest book, Raft, which came out at the end of April, was about three years in the making with most of the actual writing happening during the summers and then mm. some clean cleanup and editing going on when I could during the school year. That's awesome. Do you, do you feel like you, I don't know, do you feel like you enjoy writing books more than you enjoy writing for television and, and TV no, uh, sorry, the, and film? Yeah. One of the things that's very, it's very funny and a, a, a tiny bit, but I mean this in the best possible way, but a tiny bit frustrating is, like I said, the book came out at, at the end of April there's more than 20 reviews on Amazon right now that I, I, I can brag and say are all five star, which is lovely. Nice, nice. But of the 20 reviews, I think at least seven of them say, can't wait to see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a book. It's not a movie. <laughs> so whether uh, that will right. happen at some point, I don't know. But it's really funny every time I look at the review and there's another one that says, can't wait for the movie. This is wow. You know, you know what so, though? That that's so common because like I I'm watching a couple of shows right now. Uh, one Silo on Apple TV, which I'm don't give it thoroughly. Away. I'm not. I'm thoroughly <laughs> enjoying it. Uh, really good because I love post-apocalyptic stuff and stuff like that. And I was sitting down with my roommate. And we were watching it because we watched it together. And I was like, wow, who are the showrunners on this? Because, like, I need to know because, like, I want to, you know, follow more of their work. I want to look at – and then it was, like, based off of uh, this book. And I was like, son of – like, I still want to follow the showrunners. But, like, clearly, like, it's so common now for it just to be book to film that, like, I'm not surprised yep. people are making comments like that. So, yeah. yeah. So the different processes, but – I, I mean, one of the things that's, uh, all right, I got to back it up a tiny bit because <laughs> yeah. when the publisher first approached me about wanting to get involved with Raft, they said one of the things we really responded to was we laughed on every page and we cried at the end, but we feel like the audience for this book is the audience that grew up on your movies because they are now the young adults with their own families that we feel would really relate to this, mm -hmm. but you have to have a way to reach them. And I said, I have very, very studiously and vociferously avoided social media at all costs for many, many, many different reasons, not least of which is as a professor, I just never wanted to get into the, you know, look where I am, look what I'm doing, and then have students yes. go, but you friended her, why didn't you friend me? And just all oh, of it I seemed see. like just fraught with danger. So I studiously avoided it, and they were like, yeah, but, you know, that would be a really good way to meet your fan base. Yeah. And so what I ended up doing was I – Last June, just a year ago now, I hired one current and one former student to like, if you guys will create this, if you will curate it, if you will say, dude, stand in front of this and answer this question, <laughs> you know, we, we will do all the mechanics of it. And we got that up on both TikTok and Instagram. And yes. I, th I think it was the first or second TikTok video that we posted. <clears throat> and I was at lunch the day after it went up and the student that was running it for me I kept getting texts from her going, dude, you're blowing up. Dude, you're going viral. And I was like, I don't even know what any of that means, but I'll trust <laughs> you. And then he sent me, you know, open this up. And it, the one of the videos we posted had 2.8 million views. Wow. And it, it was a Land Before Time based thing yeah. that apparently got on, you know, again, I don't understand the algorithms or any of what does what, but <laughs> it did that. And then it went like in a couple of days, from a couple hundred followers to 13,000 followers and wow. just you know, all this stuff started happening. And so it was like, well, I guess they're right that they, you know, <laughs> those people are out there. And so, you know, now we're hoping that some of those 13,000 will also buy the book. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So do, is it's it amazing. 
Yeah, I was going to say, is it weird for you for like to think about like, – because obviously social media, TikTok's like within the last, what, three, four years, two years, whatever it is. Um, is it weird for you to, to have that realization that, wow, there's those people who grew up on something that I wrote and that are still fans to this day that – saw this and were like wow like i want to connect with this guy yeah i mean none of that happened with any awareness at all until i started teaching and one of the things that again is is something i've imparted to students many many times is show business is constructed so that you are never a success as long as you are in it and you know I worked with Spielberg, I worked with Goldie Hawn, I worked with Tom Hanks, I've worked with people, and they all at some point in the relationship have said, every movie I finish, I'm sure I'm never going to work again. Hmm. And, you know, Hmm. one of the stories that I tell is Spielberg had produced, I mean, had directed Jaws and Close Encounters, and Columbia Pictures put E.T. in Turnaround. We don't Hmm. see it, we don't get it, we're not making your little alien movie, take it somewhere else. Do do you mind explaining what Turnaround is for the audience? Yeah. It means a studio develops a project, they get certain, you know, somewhere down the line and go, we took another look at it, we looked at the budget, we're not making this movie, we're giving it back to you. You can take out Got it. And so you would think if the guy who made Jaws and Close Encounters comes, and I I have to say, E.T. at the time was a $12 million budget. So we're not talking about that he wanted to do his $275 million alien movie. It was a $12 million movie. And they said, sorry, we're not making it. Mm. It went to Universal. The rest is history. The fella at Columbia did not have his job a whole lot longer after that. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, But my point is, you know, we always assume you get to this certain point and then all the rest is easy and gravy and it's just never is. Yeah. And so, you know, I never had any awareness of a larger fan base. And then when I started at UCR in particular, there would usually once a quarter, somebody would kind of knock on my door during office hours and usually kind of timidly put their head around the corner and go, um, hi, I just wanted to introduce myself because, um, dude, you wrote my childhood. <laughs> like, All right, come on in. You know, That's awesome. I don't bite. And so kind of the, social media thing has been the next exponential realization of that and and like i said with this the what the video was that went viral was me talking about because people would always say it it was one of the comments in an earlier video how come all of the dinosaurs had names like petrie and littlefoot and spike and sarah was sarah and so i was told that part of the appeal was my snarkiness but i went guys pay attention she's sarah c-e-r-a because she's a triceratops it's not She's not like, she's, and then half the comments were, well, duh, I knew that. And then another third, another third were, well, I had close captioning because I, so I knew because I saw CERA. Mm. And then at least 50% was, you blew my mind. I've never done it. (laughs) And then it was all this engagement back and forth between who knew what and who was smarter than who. And, you know, that was kind of what was off and running, but it it was really funny to me. And then, you know, just in January, the Motion Picture Academy Museum in Los Angeles had a screening of Land Before Time on a Saturday morning. And it was, you know, filled with young families. And and a lot of the people there, once they said the writers here today were coming over and saying, you know, this was my favorite movie as a kid. And now I'm bringing my kids. Yeah. And it's like, that's cool. That's really special. Wow. For sure. I I do have some questions about, um, like, sort of like part of your journey, right? So, yeah. you know, you're <clears throat> you're in LA, you're starting to write stuff. Um, did you did you start to get an agent? Is that how you started to get jobs? Did you what was your what was your sort of method of, of like getting work when yeah. you first got here? Yeah, I really, you know, as much as I said I had the early inspiration that this is what I wanted to do even when I was a kid, I had no knowledge of how the business actually worked and I had no connections it wasn't like my mom saying you know Uncle Harry works at Paramount look him up when you get there there was no you know no connection at all and so when I first was here I just blanketed the town with anything that I thought was even remotely related to the entertainment industry so I applied to radio stations I applied to be a page at NBC a tour guide at Universal a critter at Disneyland and you know I would write to them and go I'm short. I could be Chip. I could be Gail. I could be Donald Duck. I got a nice put me in the duck suit. I'm good. You know, uh, 
again, didn't get those jobs, but the first job that I did get was at the long defunct Los Angeles Herald Examiner newspaper. And I was hired as a copy boy, which was the equivalent of being a PA on a film set. You're just a runner for all the different departments. But every minute I wasn't on any kind of mission or errand, I was hanging around the entertainment department and I was talking to the writers there and asking them questions and asking them, you know, if this is what I want to do, what should I be doing? Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the first thing they said was, nobody's going to read your stuff until you get an agent because mm -hmm. production companies and producers are afraid of lawsuits and, you know, all the rest of it. And so at the time, the Writers Guild had a published list of accredited agents and then several on the list would have an asterisk next to them, which meant they were willing to read from unproduced writers. Mm -hmm. So once I learned that, then it was sending out query letters and sending out, here's who I am, here's what I do, describing a couple of scripts and saying, if you're interested, I'd be happy to send them to you. Then I would do follow-up phone calls to talk to the assistant and go, hi, what's your name? Here's who I am. I sent a letter in, you know, do you have any thoughts or suggestions? And then the other thing while I was working at the Herald was, I started to bug them enough in the entertainment department that they let me start doing movie reviews and celebrity interviews. Nice. And every time I went on a celebrity interview, I'd do the interview and then at the end go, hey, do you have 10 minutes? Because I'd love to pick your brain about. And most people were really quite wonderful. And I got to do nice. an interview with Sally Struthers, who was the daughter on All in the Family at the time, and Suzanne Plachette, who was the wife on the Bob Newhart show. And with each of them, I would just go, do you have any advice on what I should be doing? And it was kind of impressive how lovely everybody was in terms of taking that time and giving some thoughts and giving advice. And, and it all just kept coming back to, you know, you really do need an agent. Um, and then I, I always think about how much full disclosure, but it's just you guys and your audience. <laughs> um, but I was doing after I quit the Herald after 18 months. And part of that was they were having me do more and more writing. And it was another situation like I referenced earlier was I was working 40 hours, but then going out to these events and screenings and doing stuff after hours. And I had a moment of, I'm quickly going to become a newspaper reporter and not a screenwriter. Mm. And so I quit and I went on this year and a half phase of, I would work temp jobs for two or three weeks, put money in the bank, then write for two or three weeks, look at the bank account and go, shoot, you better go back and work a couple of weeks. <laughs> so, so I was doing that in rotation, but always writing in between. Yeah. And through an ad in the Daily Bruin at UCLA, they were looking for marijuana research guinea pigs at UCLA Med Center. <laughs> and at that point in the study, they had discovered there was medicinal effects that were beneficial for both glaucoma and asthma. And they were trying to find a dose where you got the medicinal effects without getting high. And hmm. so I was we, we called it the cuckoo's nest because there was me and five other guys in the we were locked up in ucla med center for two weeks we couldn't leave <laughs> and every morning you would line up and get your medication and the medication was anywhere from placebo to straight thc yeah. and then you would do these like breathing tests and eye tests and stuff all day trying to see you know where in the gradation can we find the medical benefits without mm. getting high and of course every morning you take your meds you'd sit there and then somebody would go <laughs> <laughs> okay you got the THC today and somebody else would go well I'm not feeling anything bummer I got the placebo and everybody else was somewhere in between so the whole reason I bring that up is I was locked up in the study and the, all we had was access to a pay phone and my roommate called and said can you ask him to call me back and I called him back and he said you got an envelope from an agent and it's the first time where it's just a little envelope and not your script coming back in a return thing. Do you want me to open it for you? And it was a very small boutique agency who said, we loved your script. We liked your work. We'd like to work with you. You know, give us a call. And it was like, damn, I'm locked up in this thing. <laughs> it was like for another 10 days. So I had to call him from the payphone. I was like, hi, I'm out of town visiting my parents in upstate New York. When I get back, you know, and That's funny. got out of the study, went and met with him, and he became my first agent and got me my first paid writing job as a screenwriter. Wow. That's amazing. That's so good. I I actually have a little a, a little different, uh, a, another story that's similar <laughs> to that, where I, I also was part of a clinical trial, and I was locked up for like 20 days. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's good to like, because those, you have a lot of time too in those things, so you can like write in there and I was learning how to speed read and type. Uh, uh, 
and you have no distractions because there's like you can't literally can't do anything. You're 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 trapped. Um, it's, but that's except in the days when you were on the straight THC, then it was a little hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's really cool. That's a fun. That's a super fun story. Um, so so you've so now you've got an agent, right? You're you're being read by this boutique agency, and and you're starting to get things right. Like when did you? F- was there ever a moment um, in your sort of development as a as a TV and film writer that you you felt like you really just understood the industry, like you understood like all of the, you know, because when you when you're looking at the industry from an outside perspective, you're like, oh, I don't know any of these terms. I don't know what's going on. Like, what's the legal part of it? Like, well, how does the business work? Was there ever a point, you know, where you, or, or when was the point where you realized, you know what, I think I have a pretty good handle on this? Um, it's interesting because one of the things that I have said many times and, and truly believe is the interesting thing about show business is just when you think they found every possible way to break your heart, they find a new way. <laughs> so, you know, over the years, every high hit came with some kind of a low. There was always yeah. a pinnacle and a crash. And, you know, yeah. as I mentioned, you know, learning how to sustain that, learning how to have a real life around that. Um, I was very fortunate because on the very first movie I made, I met uh, the woman who became my girlfriend, who is now my wife of 42 years. Nice. Um and at the time, she was working for Gary Marshall, and she first was wa- working on Happy Days. She was one of the kids in Arnold. She got to kiss the Fonz more than once. <laughs> um, part of the reason a couple of years ago I was able to have Henry Winkler and Ron Howard be guests together in my Filmmaker's Life class at UC wow. Arbus, because you know, I've known them back to when we were dating, and so you know, more than 45 years that I've known the guys. Wow. Um, but at the time, Hillary, my wife, gave Gary a script that I had written, and he optioned it and he was kind of the first leap into the big leagues for me. So I was doing a bunch of low budget teen coming of age type projects. And then when Gary not only optioned the script, but then he hired me to co-write a script with him. And that got me a lot of industry traction because people were talking about, you know, who's this kid that's working on two projects with Gary. And, Mm -hmm. and then the other thing that happened almost simultaneously, that was kind of the biggest break of my entire career was, are you guys familiar with the blacklist? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So at the time, the equivalent of it was American Film Magazine used to produce the 10 best unproduced. I mean, do an article every year that was the 10 best unproduced screenplays in Hollywood, which is similar to what the blacklist is. Mm. And what they would do is poll producers, studios, agents, everybody on the business side of the business and say, what are, what's the favorite script you read this year that hasn't been made yet? Mm. And, I had to, and this is another very strong piece of advice of, like I said, the first couple of things I did were all age appropriate, teen, angsty, coming of age stuff. And I realized that writers get typecast as quickly as actors do. And so I took three months off. I wrote a script that was a multi generational family comedy that was kind of the most autobiographical but reflective of my sensibility as a writer. And that script is the one that ended up on the blacklist. Mm. And what's interesting and I think really instructive to students and wannabe writers is it was optioned three times. So three different production companies picked it up and paid money, but the movie never got made, Mm -hmm. but it still was the most important thing that I ever wrote because that got me to producers, Josh Brand and John Falsey, who had done um, Northern Exposure and St. Elsewhere and The White Shadow. And they were doing a new show called A Year in the Life that they hired me to it ultimately became first a mini series that was a six hour mini series and I wrote three hours of it. They wrote the other three hours of it and it won the Emmy that year for the best mini series. Yes. And I got that job because they read Kim Folk and really liked it. And then they became the executive producers of amazing stories and hired me for that, which is how I got to Steven. And then Steven kept me on the amazing stories for a year or two. And then that led to land before time. So wow. all of those things happened because of Kinfolk, even though the movie never got made, my career did get made by that script. Wow. Uh, for those, uh, for the audience members who don't know, you want to explain what the blacklist is really quick? Yeah. Basically, it is a, a, a thing, like I said, similar to what the American Film Magazine did at the time, where they just solicit, tell us scripts that you read, that you loved, that have not yet been produced, and then it goes out to everybody of, you know, these are scripts you should be aware of, and often many 
of those movies then go on to be successful films that got the mm. boost by ending up on the list to begin with. Mm, interesting. And that's just because... So these are, these are all scripts that uh, writers have just sent to a bunch of different people. Obviously, if, if, a, if a person's been... If it's been voted and it's been put on the blacklist or the American uh, Film Journal... And that means that multiple people have read it. So yeah. like multiple producers, directors, all, uh, studio executives. And so I guess that what I'm, what I'm kind of surmising from this is that like you need to have all of your stuff out there constantly because having it out there all the time means that more people are going to be able to see it and understand and know that that's out there. 100%. And then, you know, the other thing that I was very conscious of, as I mentioned, the idea of writers getting typecast as quickly as actors do, I was always mixing up the kinds of things I was doing because I have a friend who was very, very, very focused in the horror genre and he was very successful there. But then several years ago, I hadn't seen him in a while. And hey, what have you been up to? And he goes, oh, I'm so bummed. I wrote this, what I think is a great romantic comedy. And a lot of people don't even want to read it because they only know me as the horror guy. Yeah. And the reluctant, you know, to take a look at it. And so I was always very conscious of that. And one of the other kind of dirty secrets of Hollywood is, you know, after I did the movie Monkey Trouble with Thora Birch and Harvey Keitel, the next job I got offered was Curious George. <laughs> and I went to the meeting and it was like, you guys, I'm not the monkey guy now. You know, <laughs> and, and I just did my monkey movie. I'm not really interested in doing the next monkey movie to be the monkey guy. You right. know, so that was a job that I turned down. But what I was going to say about the, the unspoken dirty secret is mm -hmm. if you are somebody who is in a position to turn down jobs, it only makes you that much more desirable mm -hmm. because part of the perversity of the business is this guy's not desperate. He didn't come in with a flop sweat of, you know, you have to hire me. He turned us down. And I would say 80 percent of the time that I turned a job down within the next six months, that same company called me back for something else. And wow. Part of, you know, being able to kind of find and maintain that integrity, for lack of a better word, was often I would go in on a job and so many times it was a script that they needed to rewrite on and you'd get the script and I'd read the script. And, and if I couldn't find the way in, if I couldn't find the thing I was relating to or I can see the way to make this better, I understand what's inherently interesting. I know how to make it better. If I couldn't find that, I didn't want to go in and my way into a job that I then couldn't deliver. Yeah. Because again, your reputation is based on, like I said, my reputation at the Disney Channel was built on this guy delivers. This guy gives us stuff we can make. And I, I didn't want to be in a position with a company going, you know, no matter who you are, no matter how much I'd like to work with you, if I can't do a good job, I'm not serving either of us. So I'm just going to have to pass. Thank you. Yeah. That's really, I think that's really smart. And I, and I oftentimes kind of, wonder you know um how you sort of make it the the distinction uh for yourself like you know i guess it's you know your your training and how you how you sort of try to find that that way into the scripts but like you know you're talking about <clears throat> integrity and and sort of speaking maybe maybe uh to something that you care to write or you want to write how do you sort of find what that voice is if that makes any sense yeah, yeah. I, I think it's about really trusting yourself and listening to your for lack of a better term inner detector hmm. uh, you know so there would be times where I somebody's pitching me something and it's like okay you're seeing something I'm not you know hmm. god bless you it's, it's not it, it's so always subjective it's not a right yeah. or wrong but it's like i cannot find my way in i cannot relate to that and and i'm always been and it's true with my books as well i'm a character driven writer and so i'm not a big plot guy if you look at any of my stuff it's not incredibly inter i could never write a mission impossible movie i could never write a born movie it's just not the way my brain works mm. and so my entree is always who's this character what do they want? How do I relate to them? How can I pull things from my own life that's going to make them dimensional and relatable? And if I can't find that, I can't do it. Hmm. And, and that's kind of the metric for me is I, I just, you know, there was a script. This was always my favorite story. 
because it was a script that Paramount bought for a million dollars. Okay, they bought the script for a million dollars. And then I got the call that said, we really don't like very much about it at all. It needs to pay what you want to rewrite. Do you want to take a crack at it? Hmm. And the premise of the movie was like a seven-year-old kid who became a Hollywood agent. <laughs> and it was like, and I care why? And I'm invested in what? And he's a precocious little jerk. Why? <laughs> 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 And who cares about the story of a Hollywood agent anyway, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was just like, so you got to explain to me, people, you paid a million dollars, you don't really love the script, you kind of like the premise, but you don't know what to do with it. You want to pay me a million dollars for an idea you don't like? I got a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I just said, you know, thank you for thinking of me. I appreciate coming in, but I, I got to pass. I, I, I just can't help you. I don't know how well, to make this. I don't know how to take that and make that a good idea. I, yeah. How, I'm going to pivot a little bit here, but yep. I, I'm just really curious about this. How many scripts have you written that no one's ever, no one's, I mean, obviously that no one's made, not that no one's ever seen, but that has, haven't been made. Uh, last year I got a reach out from the UCR library mm -hmm. and they said, would you be interested in us arc, uh, housing your papers? And I went, would you what now? <laughs> you know? And they said, you know, we we would like to archive your creative work or whatever term they use. But all of it was like, like you mean like my presidential library? Like, what are we talking here? I feel like it, it was so like, do you, you know who you have on the phone now, right? <laughs> They were like, yeah, yeah, we'd, we'd love to, you know, be able to have your scripts and whatever mater production materials and stills from your work and do some yeah. kind of Krieger archive. And it was like, yeah, okay. Um, but in working with them on that this year, I was pulling scripts off the shelf where I would look at the cover page, look at the title and go, what the hell was this? <laughs> <laughs> and I would have to flip through and, and read like 25 pages and go, wait a minute, I think that... So the answer to your question is hundreds. Wow. Um, and what's interesting is part of my pivot to television and the Disney Channel and all the rest of it was I had probably five or six years where I made a really good living. I mean, a six figure plus living wow. on things that were not getting made. And so things were getting optioned. I was paid to write. I was the first writer on the Rugrats movie and then other writers came on subsequently. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole bunch of things where I was making a very lovely living. Yeah. but nothing was getting produced and it was really frustrating. Yeah. And it was, you know, there's only so long that you can tell the relatives back East. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working on this thing with Spielberg. Well, what happened to that? Well, you don't want to know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so part of the, when I, you know, made the turn to TV, it was like, they're making stuff, stuff's getting made. Yeah. And, and like I said, with the Disney channel, I had a run where like six months in a row, every month I had a movie on. Yeah. Um, and that's just really fun and really rewarding and much more. You learn so much from seeing things get made from the transition to page to screen. And so, you know, I would say the ratio to what got made versus one didn't was probably at least 15 to one. Hmm. And so, wow. you know, there is a, wow. a large archive. And, and like I said, if it's 15 to one, 11 of those I got paid for in some fashion, either optioned or paid to write drafts of. Yeah. And then they get made for various reasons. Um, wow. That's yeah. great. That's I mean, it's uh, I think a lot of times you know when you're, and this is sort of just because not you don't have the uh, the experience or the the insight, but you know when you look at a at a person you know like yourself and you're like, oh man, like he just gets a lot of stuff made, you know, like he, all all the things he had written, he probably has made. You know, people are just beating down his door to to make all of his stuff, <laughs> but to hear that you've got hundreds of scripts that you know haven't seen the light of day for one reason or another is, is interesting. And I think it's, and it's probably something that's good for people to hear because, you know, that means you need to be grinding and, and, you know, there's probably, would you say less than 20% of your works have been created? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But, but then the other thing that's really important to reinforce is yeah. then there's kinfolk, you know? So again, a script yeah. that never got made, but was responsible for all of the major accomplishments that I was able to do. That was the stepping stone, you know, yeah. that led to, a, like I said, led to year in the life that led to amazing stories that led to land before time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So nothing is a waste. Nothing is yeah. a waste of time. 
everything you're learning from, you're growing from, and you never know which one's going to be the calling card. Right. And I, I had a movie that ended up getting made for what was ABC Family at the time, but that movie got made because I had written it originally as a spec script. Uh, Disney Studio optioned it as a feature. They ended up putting it in turnaround and giving it back to me. And then 10 years later, a woman who had been the executive on the project called and said, whatever happened to that script, I really liked it. I'm now at ABC Family and we're looking for a project like that. Do you, is it like, do you own the rights to it currently? And I said, yeah. She said, send it to me. And they wow. ended up making it. Wow. That's that awesome. 10 years, yeah. 10 years after the first time. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Um, so I think we're, are we Yeah, we're getting close to the, yeah, the close. time? I mean, we could talk for hours. I got so many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do. I do have one question, and this, these are just sort of like because we've used these terms a couple of times. So, like, yep. uh, what does optioning mean, just for uh, the people at home? Sure. Um, so, when you send a spec script, which is a script you wrote without being paid for, you wrote it on yourself uh, by yourself. Speculation is the spec is short for that. Um, goes out to the town, and if somebody's interested in possibly producing it, ninety percent of the time they don't outright buy it from you. They will take an option, and an option is a little bit like a lease. So normally, for just for round numbers, if eventually their purchase price would be a hundred thousand dollars if the movie gets made, your option is five or ten thousand dollars that you get up front, but that's money against eventual production. Hmm. And what comes with the option is a finite amount of we're optioning it for six months, we're optioning it for one year. That's part of your negotiation as well. And at the end of that period of time, if they have not made it, the project reverts back to you. You retain the rights. If the movie gets made and they paid you ten thousand up front, you get a balance of ninety thousand mm -hmm. against your hundred thousand. If they put it in turnaround, give it back to you, then if somebody else picks it up, they owe the original studio the money they so if they put out ten thousand dollars, the new studio has to pay them back their ten thousand dollars and then create a new option of their own. But there's money what they call against the project, which means this is money that's already been spent mm -hmm. and a new studio has to pay back the original studio. And then I they see. can the rights free and clear on. So, over. so if if you were to option a script to you know Warner Brothers, and they say you know here's your uh, ten, ten percent or whatever you know five to ten thousand, and then you know they don't make it, a uh, year goes by, uh, it goes back to you, you take it to ABC, you they want to option it as well, they don't pay you, they pay the other. Well, they've got to pay off the cost first. Right, they have to pay off the cost. And then it's a new first. negotiation with you. So it would be, I see. okay, now we're, we're re-optioning it for you, and how, and that's your agent and lawyer do the actual deal-making for you. Got it. But then it's a brand-new negotiation. They just have to clear the rights to it by paying off the previous debt first. Got it. And so they play, let's just say, just, just, I, I just, it makes it yeah. like, makes it easier for me to understand. So sure. let's say they pay off the five to 10 K to Warner brothers. And now after they do that, now they can renegotiate with you and they say, all right, in order to option this, we're going to pay you five to 10 K. And then now we're, now we're in the agreement with you. And does the, the portion that they paid off the first, um, studio, does that go against the project? Not once it's paid off, but it yeah. can, so, okay. you know, when I mentioned that, that I was the first writer on the initial Rugrats movie, yeah. when I got replaced, I was at a party with the writers who replaced me and I happened to know them from previous things that we'd been involved in. And one of them came up to me and they go, we hope you're happy, dude. And I go, I'm really happy. Why? <laughs> and they said, because when our agents went to negotiate, they said, we paid most of the money we had in the budget to Krieger. You're getting hit and so I take it or leave it. <laughs> So they said, according to our intel, we got like a third of what you got paid, and, and you're not even the final writer on it. I go, hey, sucks to be you. <laughs> so, so funny. yeah. So sometimes you know they can use that against you if you're not the first writer. But I see. Again, that that when it's an, a brand new option, you have the uh, ability to just go, hey, that deal doesn't work for me. Thanks, I'm moving on. Right. So you know, nice. It, I think that's great. I, I just, I like to, you know, for the, yeah. for the people at home, just to know what the ins and outs of that, because uh, you're, you're schooling me for sure. So that's great. <laughs> um, before we move on to the next section, 
Christopher's mm. got a question. Yes, 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 yes. If you had one piece of advice you could give our listeners or just a film up and coming filmmaker, a student, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give them? Just follow your heart and do it. it. You know, it's back to the Professor Nike thing in terms of I was at an event at my alma mater in upstate New York several years ago, and it was a day long event. And I don't know if you guys know who William Fichtner, the character actor, is. If you don't by name, Google him after the show. And as soon as you look at him, that dude, he is in everything. Um, he was on Entourage. He was on Prison Break. He's in The Dark Knight. He just finished a show called The Company You Keep. He was Alice and Jenny's yeah. husband on Mom. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. He and I went to the same college and we did this event together. And one of, this is a sidebar, but one of my favorite parts of the day was as we were walking across campus from event to event, kids were hanging out of the dorm yelling at him but everybody yelled a different credit to him. So we'd walk up to the place and they go, dude, Dark Knight, love you. And then we'd walk a couple more feet and they go, perfect storm, oh man. You know, so everybody knew him from something different. Yeah. But at the end of this big event we did in an auditorium with 500 people, this guy came up to me and he was my age and he had a script in his hands and he was like, you know, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I always wanted to be a writer and I so envy what you did and I'm 55 years old now and I'm thinking of maybe moving out to Hollywood. And I said, don't. You know, God bless you, but don't. Nobody, is, you know, 55 years old is not the time to start your career as a Hollywood screenwriter. Mm. Um, you know, I got to be honest with you. I would not be doing you any favors. And and he was, I know, and I could, I should, I would. And I have said many times to students, to me, the life of regret is the saddest one. Mm. And especially as a young person, chase the dream. Go for it. You, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen is, down the road you have to pivot but mm. if you get if you when you make that pivot it's with the i gave it everything i had i gave it my best shot it just mm. didn't work for me now it's time for plan b that's great but to be the 55 year old guy i oh I, if i could if i should i if i would i wished i why didn't i those are the really sad lives to be in so mm. the thing i feel so grateful for and so blessed with is every time i've had to make any kind of pivot and turn it was because i wanted to because i was ready to and you know, doing the writing and then moving into television, then moving from television to academia and mm -hmm. writing the books and doing all of that. I got to make those choices as opposed to somebody saying like, eh, your time's up, move on, old man. You know, I always felt I jumped before I was pushed and that's been a really nice life. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really great. Okay, so we've got uh, our game that we're going to play. Um, all right. And uh, today's game, we're talking about uh, the movies in the past year. Which one do you feel like were just overhyped? And then also, or like, let's say, let's just choose one, right? Which movie do you feel like is overhyped? And then also, which movie do you feel like was underhyped or was a sleeper? You know? Yeah, I, I'm going to be a little general on the overhyped because i think yeah. you know we I, I am really 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 hoping and maybe the flash is part of that that we're getting near the end of the superhero cycle i just think mm. you know everything from justice league to all the marvel movies all the dc it's just enough already uh and i think every time they've tried to reinvent and reimagine and reconfigure and okay michael keaton's back and he's batman again it's like okay <laughs> but come on can we you know can we have a little bit more originality a little yeah. bit more interesting things that we're doing so i think that ca if i can put a whole category is yeah. overhyped i think that's where we are yeah. um for me even though it got a bunch of academy award nominations the banshees of Inisherin sharon was a movie that mm. i absolutely loved and i was kind of surprised in talking to students and other folks of how many people had not heard of it despite i think yeah. it got nine or ten oscar nominations yeah um i really really truly will go to my grave believing colin farrell was robbed of his oscar yeah. um there are moments in that movie that are so beautiful and painful and hilarious at the same time. Uh, and Brendan Gleeson are so wonderful together that that for me was the one that I was on the rooftops going, see this movie, people. <laughs> um, but it is also a very dark comedy that is not everybody's sensibility. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there was a couple of people I recommended that are really still mad at me. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I'm okay defending it. I think it's an amazing movie and I'm a giant Martin McDonough fan. Yeah. And bringing the whole thing full circle, the fact that he and Phoebe Waller-Bridge are a couple is so intriguing to me. 
So, you know, putting Martin McDonough and Fleabag together, I'm all good. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's really crazy. Uh, I love, I mean, I love Fleabag. Yeah, such a good, such a good show. Um, so, just to close out, where can people find you? I know you didn't have social media before, but now you do. I do. So, <laughs> so where can people find you? At Stu Krieger on both Instagram and TikTok. Nice. Um, as I mentioned, the novel Raft is now available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble dot com. Uh, if you liked any of my movies, I truly do think you will enjoy the book. Uh, yes. It is the comic fable of a children's book author named Clark Whitaker, who is having a midlife crisis, turning 50, afraid that everything in his life is going to be about loss, gets in a giant fight with his wife and wakes up and he's a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> there's no reason. There's no more. Uh, the way I pitched it to the publishers when wow. they first got involved was I said, some men, when they hit their midlife crisis, some leave their wives for a younger woman, some take up mountain biking, Clark Whitaker turned into a penguin. Stuff happens. Deal with it. Uh, <laughs> so it is the that's adventure. That's so interesting. Of, I love Dad's that. a penguin. What do we do now? And that's the, the comic adventure of Raft. Wow, uh, that's amazing. Let's check it out. That's such a. It's. I mean, I wouldn't even have thought about that. That's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Fine. I love that. Yeah. Um, as I, as I said, check out the reviews on Amazon because I think if you are a fan of my film and television work, you will enjoy the book. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I definitely, I definitely am, and I'm, uh, I'm also really grateful that you decided to come on the show today and uh, just, you know, school us, literally, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much you, for it. coming on today. Yeah, yeah. So, Daisy and Christopher, thank you both. Really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. That's a wrap for today's episodes on the Lot One Podcast. Thank you so much for joining, and we hope you found this episode insightful and informative. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and a review. It helps others discover our show and let us know what you want to hear more of. And don't forget to follow us on social media at lot1 underscore productions for behind the scenes content and updates on upcoming episodes. We'll be back next week with another exciting episode featuring a special guest from the film industry. Until then, keep creating and keep dreaming big. And remember, the filmmaking journey is full of ups and downs, but it's the passion and dedication that keeps us going. See you next week. Thank you.